Hey guys, you know it. Let's stand and let's sing that chorus of Draw Me Near. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Pray with me, Father, we thank You for the morning that You've given us. And everything that we do here this morning, God, may you be lifted up to give glory and honor and praise as you are worthy. God, we love you and we thank you for the freedom that you've given us to be able to come here today. <clears throat> and as your word is open, may we open our hearts. God, we love you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, remain standing and sing with us. This is for the lost and lonely, for the broken and afraid. This is for those who are hurting, hoping help is on the way. In these battles of addiction, fears chasing after me, whatever troubles I am facing, I will lift my hands and sing.
days we all will stand in judgment for every single word that we have spoken. One of these days we all will stand before the throne, give a reason for everything we've done. And what I Jesus, my friend. 
Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning. I, um, I hope that that is your prayer this morning. Before we take up our offering and we worship and our giving, I just want to share with you a verse of Scripture related to that. In Psalm 119, verse 18, it says, Open my eyes so that I, I may contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. A good prayer to pray uh, before you listen to a sermon, before you read the word or listen to it being read, is to ask the Lord to open your eyes so that you could contemplate and understand and see the wondrous things that God has for you in his word. And so we want to pray that in just a moment. I want to draw your attention to something in the bulletin as a way to, give, to show you an opportunity to give. So uh, during the month of August, we are, um, the clothes closet is collecting clothing, um, different items for um, boys and girls summer clothes and shoes for school, um, all kinds of different things, scrubs for CNA students, backpacks, lunch boxes. So if you have those things that you would like to donate, then we have a table set up over here in the Family Life Center. We want you to bring those and to give to that. And I say that to not only ask you to give to that, but also to show you that there are opportunities for you to be a generous giving people. And that your gifts, the things that you give, go to serve our community. And that's what we want to see happen. We want to see our community served, and we want to see the gospel go forth to the ends of the earth. And so this is your opportunity here this morning, to worship in your giving. Thank you for how you do give, but I pray that you'll continue to do so because God has been generous to us. And if God has been generous to us, then we should be generous to other people. Amen? I ask our men to come. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to bless as we give and to just thank him for the opportunity that we have to give. Father, this morning we thank you for your goodness and your generosity to us and ultimately sending your son Jesus to be our savior. We thank you for the blessings you give to us. We are rich beyond measure. We're so grateful. And even though um, the richness is not always measured by material things, Lord, we still say that we're rich because of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that we have in Christ Jesus. And so I pray that you would help us to not be stingy or greedy, but to be generous people to those around us. I pray that you would help us to give, and to give not some set amount that maybe we've heard about, but that you, we would give from our hearts, and that we would give in proportion to what you've given to us. Lord, as we open the word in just a moment, I pray that you would open our eyes so that we could contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. Open our eyes so that we could truly see Jesus today. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you sing with us?
have a Bible, and I hope that you do, would you take it out and turn in it to the book of Genesis, chapter number one. Well, we started a series in Genesis last week called Foundations, and we made it through one verse. So this might end up being a, an incredibly long series, because there are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. But today we are going to make some headway and get all the way through Verse 2. No, I'm kidding. We're going all the way through the first chapter this morning. As you're finding Genesis chapter number 1, um, let me share with you a truth that I think is going to be so important for you to understand in your life. A truth that you need to wrap your mind around and never, ever, ever forget. And here's the truth. The truth is, is that God is at work. God is working in our world. Henry Blackaby, the author of Experiencing God, recently passed away and went to be with the Lord. He had a, uh, his, one of his main principles in experiencing God was to say that God is always at work around you. You may not see him, you may not understand it, but God is always at work around you. John Piper said that God may be up to a thousand things in your life and you may only be aware of three of them. But the truth remains that God is working around us. God is always at work around us and we see that no more clearly than when we look at the story of creation. And what I want to look at this morning, we're actually going to read the entire uh, story of creation this morning. I hope that you'll follow along. And we want to see how it is God worked in the story of creation. But what we see in this is principles, our principles, for how it is God continues to work in his world. So look at with me in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, a lengthy reading here, but you follow along, and it's easier to follow along in the readings 
if you have your own Bible or if you will at least pay attention to the screen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. And they will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule over the day. What is that? The, the sun. And the lesser light to rule over the night. What is that? The moon, right? As well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was what? What was it? It was good. Evening came, and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was, it was good. And God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply. and Fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man. In our image, according to our likeness, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all the work of his creation. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to see this morning principles for how it is that God worked in creation 
and how it is that God continues to work in the world. The first thing I want to show you this morning is that God works sovereignly to accomplish his plan. God works sovereignly to accomplish his plan. God created, and you see in verse number two that everything was uh, empty and dark and formless. The, I think older translations say it was void. It was formless and empty and void. And God took that emptiness and he took that formlessness and he created. And God created in an orderly way. God took kind of the chaos of the world and he brought it together in an ordered fashion. And God actually created in ordered stages. So God created, first of all, in days. Now, when it says God created in days, I believe that he's speaking of literal 24-hour periods of time. I do not believe in the geological ages of the word days. There are some people who believe that when God created, in order to incorporate everything that must have happened, uh, for everything to be able to happen in a way that they can understand that God had to create in the days, don't really mean 24-hour periods, but it's geological ages. It could be thousands, millions, even maybe billions of years that these days happened. But I don't believe that that's the case. I believe he's speaking of a literal day, 24-hour period of time. And the reason I believe that is a couple, there are a lot of reasons, but two that I want to give you in the text is, first of all, it says after every day of creation, it says evening and morning, one day, the second day, the third day. Now, what does that seem to imply to you? 24-hour period, a single day, right? But the second reason I'll give to you is because of the idea on the seventh day, he calls it what? The Sabbath day. He calls it the Sabbath day, the day of rest, the day to cease from work, the day to spend in worship, the day to focus on God's goodness and creation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the Sabbath day, the concept of the Sabbath day, which, by the way, God's people observed throughout their history, and even still the Jewish people observe it today, and even Christians, God's people observe it today in a sense, not on the literal seventh day, but observe the concept of the Sabbath in a sense, that only makes sense if the Sabbath day is an actual day, right? So it doesn't make sense if, they, if, it, if the Sabbath day is a million years. I know some of you would like to have a million years worth of rest. And we'll get to that at the end of the sermon. We'll get to that. But, that, but I believe he created in literal 24-hour days. God ordered, created in ordered stages. But there's also a correspondence between the days. So day one goes with day four, day two goes with day five, and day three goes with day six. Here's what I mean. In day one, what did he create? He created light with day and night. He said, he said let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness so that now day exists and night exists. But what did he create on day four? He created not light, but he created the lights, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And they put them to rule over the day and the night. <clears throat> day two, what did he create? He created the sky. He separated the waters from the waters. And the upper waters, waters he considered and he called them sky or heavens. Heavens there, when it says God created the heavens and the earth, it doesn't mean that he created the heaven where God dwells. It means he created the sky and the land. That's what it means. So whenever he created this, he created the sky and the waters. But on day five, what did he create? He created the sky and the water animals, the animals that would live in those two realms. What did he create on day three? He created dry land. But on day six, he created the land animals and the humans, the ones who would dwell and thrive and live on the land. So God is creating in ordered stages, in days that have a correspondence together, but he also created everything according to its kind. Look in verse 11. He says there, um, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees, fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in a, according to their kinds. Look in verse number 12. The earth did that and it produced seed bearing plants according to their kinds. Fruit, trees bearing fruit according to their kinds. Look in verse number 21. 
God created sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in it according to their kinds. Verse 24, it says that God, uh, God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds. Verse 25, so God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. It says it numerous times to say that God created in such an orderly way that he put animals with animals of similar, of same kind. So he made elephants to be like elephants. He made dogs to be like dogs. He made cats to be like cats. He made monkeys to be like monkeys. And he did not make monkeys to be like elephants. And he did not make cats to be like dogs, obviously. Okay. And he really didn't make dog people to be like cat people either. But that's something we'll talk about another time. But God created everything according to its kind. Each has kinds. God is creating in an orderly way. And then we see that God created everything. How many times did I have you say it? God created everything good, didn't he? Everything he created was good. After every single day, it says, and God saw that it was good. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, here's three things I want to share with you that it means. It means, first of all, that God is in control. God is the one putting this all together. It's not some chaotic, chaotic hap, happenstance thing that's going on that just like happens to end up the way it is. No, God is in control of this whole thing. The second thing I'll tell you is that not only is he in control, but as he's in control, God has a plan. God has a plan that he's working out in the world. He has a plan that he is continuing to fulfill, that he fulfilled in creation. God didn't just say, you know, I woke up today. I think, I'm just, I think I'll just create land today. No, God had a plan about how he was going about it, and he had a plan for how it was going to work out. And the third thing I want you to see, not only is God in control, God is, has a plan, but thirdly, God is good. Now listen to me. What does that mean for us? What that means for us is if God is in control, if God has a plan, and if God is good, then we have no reason to fear, and we have every reason to trust him. Can I ask you something? Do you live your life in fear, or do you live your life in faith in God? Do you live your life afraid of what might happen, or afraid of what did happen? Or afraid of what's going on right now? Or do you live your life trusting the Lord? I think there are things that you can do in your life to prepare for the things that, that you want to do to protect your life and to protect your family and to, to be concerned about making sure that you have everything covered. I think God gives us responsibility to be responsible to do things that prepare us for life and to prepare us for things that are going to face or maybe we don't know about or things that are going to happen. I think God gives us responsibility for that. But you know what he never tells us to do is to worry and fear about that. And it could be, it could be that if you're living by fear, it could be that the reason is is because you're having trouble trusting him in one of these three areas. You're, you're having difficulty trusting God that he's in control. You're, di you're having difficulty trusting God that he is fulfilling his plan. Or maybe you're having difficulty trusting God that he is actually good. And God never intended you to live life like that. When we went out west a few weeks ago, um, it was an incredible trip. I highly encourage it for anybody, but I was a nervous wreck when we got to Glacier National Park. Has anybody ever been to Glacier National Park in Upper West Montana? Okay. Yeah, a couple of you. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons I was concerned is because there's, there's grizzly bears in them dire hills. <laughs> okay. And we had our bear spray, but I was like, when we, my wife loves to hike, we go out to hike. And, you know, I was really honestly... I wanted to go on the hikes where everybody was going to be. Because if I see a bear, I actually don't have to outrun the bear. 
I just have to outrun somebody else. But I've got three little ones that I have to worry about that I feel responsible for. Okay. And so this whole time, I'm just like, I'm, I'm tense. Steph can feel it. We got our bear spray, which means nothing to me. I'm like, what's this going to do? I mean, you know, like, so it's just, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous, but there were a lot of people there. We, we saw one bear from about 100 yards away, which is the right distance that you want to see it. We didn't know that happened, but God really did convict me about my worry of what's going to happen. And I had to say many times, I don't know that even my family knows this, but I did have to say many times, God, our lives. I thought about that, that song that the Brooklyn Tabernacle used to sing that said, my life is in your hands. You know, it really is. My life is in your hands. God, God, you're in control of everything that happens. My life is in your hands. You, you have a plan, and I believe that plan, and I trust that plan. And not only do I trust it, but I believe that it's a good plan, that you're good, and that whatever happens, hey, listen, we were flying. We, we, were, um, we flew into Wyoming, and just a few days after we flew into Wyoming, the Neelands were flying from Wyoming and their plane didn't make it to its destination. And we were shocked by the news of that. For many of you know them in Southern Gospel, we were shocked by that. But do you know what the surviving member of the group said when she was interviewed? She said, here's one thing that we have to remember. God is still good. Boy, that's tough to say unless you really do believe it. Whenever we see creation, we see a God who's in control. We see a God who has a plan, and we see a God who is good. And so you can trust him. You can trust him. The second principle I want to give to you this morning is that God works powerfully through his word. God works powerfully through his word. Each new day begins with the phrase, and God said, God said. God creates by his word. He creates by speaking. We see in Hebrews 11.3, the writer of Hebrews um, commenting on this. And he says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what, it is, what is seen is made from things that are not visible. God worked through his word to create. And I want you to know God still works through his word. We see God's word in creation. We see God's word incarnate. And ultimately, we see God's word in scripture. Now, if we want God to work in our lives, then it will always be through the word. God is always going to be working through the word. He worked in creation through his word, but then he worked in the world through the incarnate word, his son, the Lord Jesus. Listen to what John 1 says about Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was, oh, it's not just some inanimate word, some lifeless word. No, the word is a he. Who's he talking about there? Sunday school answer. Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus was there in the, in the beginning. And Jesus is the word of God. What that means is that Jesus is the way God has revealed himself in the world. He did it through his creation in a general way. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. So in a general way, God, you see that God exists in creation, but in a more personal, specific way, you see God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he is working in the world through his word. But then when Jesus ascends to heaven, now we have the word of God written down in scripture. And God continues to work through his powerful word. I'm not going to read it, but in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about how the word of God, this word right here, is living and active. That is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the old King James says asunder. I love it. He divides, he divides between even the joint and the marrow 
the ligament and the flesh, the muscle and whatever. He takes the thing that seems inseparable and he's able to cut right through it and to expose what's going on in the world. And he's working through that powerful word. Let me tell you something. The word of God is living and active and has life. It brings life. Exactly what it did in Genesis chapter 1. And it continues to do that today. And we cannot experience the activity of God in our life unless we do it through the word. Why is it that we tell you all the time to read the Bible? It's not because we just want you to be more religious and to check a box and make God happier with you. No, it's because we believe that this word has life. That it imparts life to you. Not in the sense of salvation. But in the sense of spiritual renewal and transformation. That as you read the word, the word works in a way that you cannot understand. You know what will happen when you start reading this word? You ready for this? When you start reading the word, you know what will happen? God will speak to you. When you read the word, you're not reading it because you hope someday to hear from God. When you read the word, you are hearing from God. God is speaking to you. And when God speaks to you, and listen, you read it, you find the truth that God is trying to communicate. And then when you adjust your life to it, not only are you hearing God speak, but you are experiencing the life of God in you as you adjust your life and he begins to work to create you more like his son. Anything God's going to do in the world, he's going to do it through his word. You know what God's going to do to save the world? He's going to do it through the proclamation of his word. You know what he's going to do to change your life? He's going to do it through the word. So if, if you're not in the word, then you have very slim chance to experience the heavenly father in your life. Here, why do I say very slim? It's because here's what God will do. What God will do is if you're not in the word, God will... Impress upon your heart through a sermon, maybe just a sense of truth the Spirit speaks to you, or through somebody else talking to you. You know what he'll do? He will impress upon your heart. There's more to what you're experiencing. But in order for you to get that, you've got to get in the Word. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. God works powerfully through his Word. Thirdly, here we go. God's work culminates in rest. Look in chapter 2, verse number 1. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all the work of his creation. Now, why did God... Rest. Well, God rested to give us an example to follow. God does not need to rest. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't take a nap. He doesn't like go on vacation. He doesn't take time off. God doesn't need to rest. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He never gets distracted. God doesn't rest. But he does recognize that we need to rest. We are, newsflash, you ready? We're not God. We get tired. We need rest. God knows we need rest. So he gave us, in his grace, a day to rest. So he did that as a, an example to follow. If you don't rest, I'm telling you, you'll wear out. If you just go nonstop, 100 miles an hour, or even 50 miles an hour, or even 30 miles an hour, but you're nonstop, eventually you're going to get to where you wear out. Spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, you'll wear out unless you find time to rest. But God rested not only to give us an example, but he rested to fulfill his plan for the ages. What do I mean by that? It's that rest, the Sabbath rest, is a picture of salvation. So listen to Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11. The writer says, Therefore, 
a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. What does he mean by that? What he's saying is that the Sabbath is a picture of the rest that God will give at the end of life through eternity. It's a picture of rest. So what is the Sabbath all? What's the fulfillment of the Sabbath? Listen, you're going to be surprised. The fulfillment of the Sabbath is not Sunday. The Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday is still the Sabbath because it's the seventh day. In terms of creation. But Sunday is a preparation for the eternal Sabbath whenever we spend resting in God and glorifying Jesus Christ for all of eternity. We have this time where we come together to practice for heaven. That's what Sunday morning is. It's a practice for heaven. We come together, we enjoy one another's company, we do work together, we serve together, we worship together, we glorify God together, but we do that knowing that one day that's what we're going to do for the rest of eternity. Salvation is pictured in the Sabbath. Right now, what that means is we're at work. This is not rest time. This is not nap time. And if you just happen to look at anything going on in the world, you should understand that there's an urgency that Christians ought to be at work right now. The devil, the enemy of God, is at work right now in the world. Christians ought to be working too. We ought to be working urgently knowing that the Sabbath rest is coming, but we don't go to sleep right now. We don't take a day off right now. In the sense that we stop living for the Lord and we stop serving Him and we stop seeking out His kingdom? No. Right now, we work. But a day is going to come when we rest. And that rest is going to be a long time. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to go to work? We're not going to be able to get into this, but one of the reasons that God created Adam and Eve, we, we will get into this in a couple of weeks, but one of the reasons they created Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve, was so that they could work. Okay, I don't necessarily like that part of the Bible, but created them to work. But you know the difference is that before sin, before sin, work was enjoyable. It was fruitful. But after sin, the work became hard and tedious. And what's going to happen is, is when we get back to this time of rest, it doesn't mean we're going to stop and do, not do anything. The rest, like we're not just going to sit on a cloud with a halo and sing, you know, play our harps and sing, you know, choir songs. It means that we'll get to work and be totally fulfilled with our work. And totally fruitful with what we do. Wouldn't you love to go to work and everything just fall into place? Have you, oh boy, that'd be a day. Mondays, everybody will look forward to Mondays in heaven. Because you'll go Monday and everything will just fall into place. There won't be anybody having a bad day. There won't be anything bad happening. You won't have to, there will be no computer systems crashing. None of that. Want to be glorious to just be able to go and everything just work out. When we get to heaven, we will. That's what rest is all about, is we're resting in the redeemed atmosphere and creation that Jesus is going to bring about. And we get to rest. Now we work. And we work hard in spite of the enemy attacking us and opposing us, but we work to one day rest. But lastly, let me just tell you this, and I'm I'm wrapping it up. God's work is fulfilled in Jesus. So how does God speak to us now? Through his word, but what is his word constantly pointing us to? Jesus. Do you know what everything is about Jesus? Everything. Hebrews chapter 1, listen to what he says. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. 
But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Did you know that not only can you not know God and experience God, except for in the word, but you cannot, listen to me, everybody look at me real quick, okay? You cannot know God apart from Jesus Christ. You can't. You cannot know him because everything in creation, everything in the word is pointing to Jesus. God has not only revealed himself through Christ, but God has accomplished his plan sovereignly through Christ. We were created for the glory of God. We're going to see in two weeks, I believe, that we lost that. But God began a mission to redeem humanity, to rescue them from their lostness. And Jesus, the the plan of God to rescue humanity culminated in Jesus dying and rising again to accomplish all this. So the question is, is, are you trusting that part of God's plan? You say, there's an old uh, evangelistic presentation that begins with this question or with this statement. Um, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I want to say that if you think of that in terms of God is going to make everything better for your life and that everything is going to go smooth and it's going to work out exactly the way that you hope and dream it would, I'm going to say that that's not always what God's plan is for you. But what if you think of it in terms of this, that God has a wonderful plan for your life, what he means by that is that God does have a plan and that means to redeem you from your sin. And that came about because Jesus died in your place. The only way that you could ever, 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 ever be saved is if you accept by faith that Jesus died and rose again. And not only do you say, I believe it in my head, but I believe it so much with my heart that I'm willing to stake my life on it. I'm willing to give my life to this whole thing. Why? Because I believe Jesus died and rose again so that I could be redeemed. And that in order for him to fulfill the plan of God for my life, I've got to follow Jesus Christ. And I've got to trust him. So are you trusting him? Don't point to church attendance as a way that you would say, I'm right with God. Don't point to your baptism. Don't point to your giving or your good works. Thank God that all those things are happening. But when you stand before God and he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? Are you going to say, well, God, I did this or I did that. If you begin the sentence with I, you've already lost. Because then what has to happen is you have to say, not me, But Jesus did something for me. Jesus did it. And the only way that you could ever experience the plan of God for your life is if Jesus is at the center of your life. But then God has given rest through his son. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. We see in this passage where it all came from. But I think a lot of us, especially Christians, are looking around and we're thinking to ourselves, I see where it came from, but where's it all going? (laughs) Where's it all heading? I remember at one time, Someone asked Adrian Rogers, Pastor Rogers, what is this world coming to? And he said, Jesus, it's coming to Jesus. What do you mean by that? For all things were created through him and for him. It may look bleak, but in the end, everything is moving to be redeemed by Jesus. And you can be a part of the redemption if you'll trust and follow him. So, would you let God work in your life by trusting and following Jesus? Would you let God work in your life by reading his word, experiencing his presence, Adjusting your life to the truth that he reveals. Would you let God work in your life by allowing him to accomplish his plan for you? To take the hands off the wheel and say, God, it's not my life, 
my life is in your hands. And would you trust God? Would you let him work by allowing him to give you, to give you rest? I want us to pray this morning with you. Bow your heads with me. Hey, Pastor Justin here. Just wanted to say thank you for joining us online for worship today. We hope that you are encouraged. If you feel like you need to make a decision, you have questions, or you just need prayer, you can get in touch with us by using the contact information on the screen. We also hope that you'll take the next step and you'll join us in person. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon.